Hey everyone, and welcome to the Boost Your Biology podcast. My name is Lucas, and I am the founder of Ergogenic Health. Together in this podcast series, we will go underground to explore cutting edge health and human performance insights that you simply cannot search on Google to help you upgrade your existence. So without any further ado, let's jump into today's episode. What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today's guest is an inventor, thought leader, and entrepreneur in health and fitness. He has co-founded the globally recognized brand Kabuki Strength, where he serves as chief visionary officer. Above all of this, till this very day, he remains to inspire and help people live better lives. Chris Duffin, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to uh, some good conversation. A little uh, pre, pre-Thanksgiving conversation, I guess. <laughs> awesome, Chris. So maybe let my listeners know a little bit about yourself. Obviously, you're an absolute strength freak holding the Guinness World Record on the sumo deadlift. Tell my audience a little bit about your story and how you got into the um, strength space. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, it, I'll try to break it into the elevator pitch uh, version, but uh uh, with the things that I've done kind of at a very high level, a lot of times people want to kind of pigeonhole you as like, oh, that's who and what you are and not understand that's going to be one expression of uh, kind of some deeper values and and impact that you're trying to have. Right. And so, um, you know, on the outside, people may come in contact with me for I'm the only person that's squatted and deadlifted a thousand pounds and I, I, I've done it for reps. And it's like, oh. He's the meathead, whatever. Uh, and then other people run into me, you know, in the in the clinical space. So I do a lot of uh, lecturing, uh, physical therapy schools, chiropractic, so on around uh, principles around movement, kinesiology, um, and the impacts uh, that that has. Um, but the the backstory is is a, is a little interesting. I've got a a very unique lens with which I look at things. So the first of that is founded during my childhood. So I grew up homeless and this is like homeless in the the wilderness type setting. So it was a very unique experience. My, my parents wanted to be off grid and basically were involved in the drug trade in Northern California in the seventies and eighties. And during the course of that dealt with, yeah, living in tree forts, living in tents, living in the back of trucks, dealt with murderers, dealt with a serial killer, dealt with human trafficking that directly affected um, the family, got taken by the state as well as my siblings, got back and ended up in uh, Eastern Oregon. Uh, I ended up having to, you know, figure out my own path. So I got myself a full ride scholarship, (laughs) academics, although I was, uh, I was a state level athlete as well. And put myself through college. And while I was working on my dual engineering degree, I took custody of my three younger siblings to get them out of the very unhealthy environment they were. And so I raised them while I chased my career, got my MBA. And so that frames a little bit of like my view around adaptation, stress, your ability to you know, be able to figure out how to leverage things to always be better if you're looking at it with the right mindset. Because we don't have control over maybe some of the things, trauma-induced things that may happen in your life. You know, we can't control that. But that's not who you are. And a lot of people fall into that subset of like, I'm the guy with a bad back. I'm a guy with whatever it is. It's it, That defines them. And my, you know, my view is your definition of oneself is your actions and responses to everything in the world, to those things that happen to you, right? And then the rest of that lens is it comes into the fitness space. So I mentioned I briefly, you know, I was a pretty good athlete as well. So growing up the way I did, it was very physical as well as um, all we had was books. And that's where my parents were, like I said, they chose to live off grid, but they were very hyper intelligent uh, individuals. And we were constantly you know, that was our source. And so it was that. And then like, I started like lifting around 11 years old, 12 years old and splitting wood hauling. We were working the mine doing, uh, 
timber like i was i was a very physical person as well and was really brought up with this strong strong mind strong back mentality and so that's been like a cornerstone for me my entire life around 2000 i started competitive lifting and that was the time i was working on my mba and advanced my career and so um the lens that i got from there over the next decade or so was you know, I became like this engineering and operations manager in the aerospace and automotive manufacturing world. So being able to look at systems and processes and coming in and turning around companies, prepping them for sale, um, doing all sorts of things in that nature in a very, uh, you know, highly engineered environment. And at the same time, I owned a gym and was training to be one of the strongest people in the world. I was at the time well, I, during the course of my powerlifting career, I was ranked number one in the world eight years straight for either the squat, the deadlift, or the total, and owned a gym because this was just a really a big passion of mine. And and I started doing continuing education because I started getting a string of injuries. And so I started just jumping straight in and doing clinical continuing education uh, uh, around neurology, kinesiology, uh, developmental kinesiology. Uh, just really trying to understand the body better. And then now, so you can imagine, here's a high level athlete with this engineering process improvement, you know, background, as well as now, you know, this, you know, this clinical continuing education, as I was doing that, I got to be friends with some of the leading people in the world. Like, they, they're my friends, like I, I text them, you know, I, we, I lecture alongside of them, but they were, I started attending their lectures first, so likes of so Dr. Stu McGill, Dr. Craig Liebenson, who brought uh, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization from Prague to the United States. Uh, the list goes on. Dr. Kelly Sturette, one of the most renowned physical therapists, on and on. And so as I'm doing this, I know I'm rambling for a while, but I'm going somewhere. This is where kind of my lens around movement and rehab and the performance setting started coming from is the way that I was looking at things with, with that background, which was a very unique mix. And I started seeing gaps, big gaps in both how people were training, how they were moving, as well as the equipment that we were using. And so in 2015, I decided to take a big risk and I walked away from my high paying, uh, well sought after career and launched Kabuki Strength. And then uh, a few years after that, Barefoot Athletics. And that's, uh, you know, it's all based on those things. Of, and I'm trying to help people with the tools that I have to be able to live a better quality of life, a mm -hmm. better quality of life through learning and having the right tools to have the stresses that you can adapt to. Because sometimes there's non-adaptive stress, just like you don't have to have, you, you don't want like traumatic experiences for personal growth. They can actually do some of the negative, there's negative repercussions that come with that, right? So how do we, how do we pair away the things, getting joints in bad position, giving the right inputs into the brain and the neurology uh, so that we can get everything focused on adaptive matter and then be able to progress and leverage forward. And so um, that's my passion. So yeah, that was a, I guess that was not quite the elevator pitch, but uh, yeah. <laughs> that's fine. No, incredibly diverse background, Chris, and um, very inspiring as a, as a fellow entrepreneur myself. Like I'd love to learn more about maybe a little bit around like your mindset throughout the years and a little bit around, I guess, building such a high level of resilience. I mean, I'd, I'd imagine you've, you've probably had a number of different setbacks uh, and things like that along the way. So maybe do you want to talk about what has enabled you or, or helped to facilitate you to, to push through all that? And also, have you had a mentor yourself over the years? Right. So, you know, there's a thought process that I think really helps. And that's in the short term, really underestimating what you can accomplish. So the big business deal, the progress in the gym, the so on is like, you know what, you're not going to make as much progress as you want. But when you're looking further out there in that long range, you probably need to actually overestimate what you think that you can accomplish because it's in the moment when you look around it, if you have these amazing dreams, and this is what I can demonstrate through the scope of my life. You know, I'm a kid that was 
heating up water in a five gallon jucket, but uh, five gallon jug so that I could pour it over my head after it sat in the sun. Uh, so I could bathe myself and, you know, was climbing up into a, you know, some tr- beams lashed up into the trees to make sure rattlesnakes weren't able to climb into my sleeping bag at bed. And then ended up being, you know, a corporate executive, you know, in the aerospace realm doing turnarounds and walked away from that. Right. So the, that can help you articulate, like that takes a long time to do. And it's one foot in front of the other. And when you're just taking one step and you're putting one step in front of the next, it feels like you may not be going anywhere. It's just that, but if you look way out on the horizon, you know, you know, off a, you know, up on a mountain and look way out there and go, man, it's unimaginable that I can get to that other peak and just put your head down and don't stare at that other peak because that's going to be demotivating and just focus on today, today, am I taking one step in that direction? And if you ask yourself that, you will more often not than find that you are not. And you are not for a week and you are not for a month and you're not for a year taking a step towards the grand vision or things that you want to accomplish in life, because it's so easy to get caught in this drudgery of living life and just the the routines that fall around you and may make you feel like you're getting a lot done. You could have your check it list. You could have your bucket list. You're knocking stuff off. You're feeling like, man, I'm killing it. But did you really take the one step that you one step that you could take this week that would step you towards that? And it may not feel like anything big. It might be taking a call. It might be applying for, you know, five jobs. It might be doing some, you know, some education and reading, prepping to go back to school. It might be, it might be a million things that just nothing happens from it. Right. But it does over time. And so it's really important to to own that because it's, it is a hard path. It's a hard road and stuff doesn't come fast. So you do have to know where that other mountain peak is, like a general idea. You may not know exactly what it is, uh, but know what you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. You know, my other mountain peak, it could have been being an orthopedic surgeon or, you know, some other thing where I'm, again, helping people live a better quality of life. I think that my path right now is a lot better because I've thought about it in depth and I want to be able to have the largest scope of impact. So having a bunch of fancy letters behind my name and a high income salary, and I'm only affecting, you know, a couple people a week, isn't going to be moving that as far as what I do. Mm. And that's why I have my book too, by the way, um, because it's covers the mental, (laughs) the mental, emotional uh, sides of this, uh, you know, developing resilience, the thought process beyond what my companies do, which is the physical realm. Mm. So let's sort of, I guess let's sort of segue, Chris, into Kabuki strength. You said before around um, you identified many gaps in the market. Maybe talk about what those gaps were and, and what Kabuki strength is designed to achieve. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, a lot of times we look at the human body in a very mechanical, structural manner. And that's coming from me as an engineer, right? And a squat's a squat, a press is a press so on. But we have a lot of different ways. And um, uh, you, you mentioned before it got on this call, we kind of mentioned maybe some other figures out there. And I know, uh, like right now, there's a lot of popular with like Andrew Huberman and some of these other that are talking about a kind of a top down, like what are we doing, you know, from a uh, from an impact of, uh, uh, you know, transmitters in the brain and how that then affects everything. But you can actually tap into things the other way around. You can tap into the peripheral and drive the inputs back to the brain, which then will drive it back out to the body. Wow, that sounds like mumbo jumbo. Like, what the heck am I talking about? What I'm talking about is take, for example, um, my Cadillac bar. It's a curved bar. The handle positions are all slightly different. And it's very similar to a football bar or as they're, as they're called, I can't remember, a, a Swiss bar. They've been around since I think the 60s or 70s. And the changes I made were very, very subtle. And what I did is I put the arc in it, gives you a greater range of motion. That's not necessarily the pertinent fact. So the pertinent component to that is that 
I move the load with the arc, the load now goes below what we call the center of rotation. So to simplify this, a regular Swiss bar or football bar, if you walk in, this is basic playground physics. If you walk into a playground, is a teeter-totter, and it'll always be sitting on one side or the other. You could potentially balance. There is a balance point, but it's infinitely perfect, which means you can't actually get there, versus if we move, move the center of mass. So in that occasion, the center of mass is on center of rotation. If we move the center of mass below center of rotation like a swing, it always returns to center. It self-stabilizes. Okay. And so we have that. And so we take out this instability. And then at the same time, the handle positions are slightly different. So the wider that you go, the, the, the more of an internal rotational bias you have towards an external rotational bias with the shoulder. And so every grip width is kind of based on the average wingspan and shoulder width so that as you go wider, it's matching that, but yet still leaving just a little bit left to cue external rotation to create some stability. What does that do? So I demoed that bar. I was, I, I work with, uh, uh, well, I work with every single major league baseball team, along with most professional sports and military and so on. Uh, it's time I didn't work with all of the, the MLB, maybe only like 70, 80%. And uh, so they're very open when I come in with ideas. I'm like, here, try this bench bar because benching is not very big in the major league baseball. And particularly if you know the history, most of the coaches, nearly all the coaches have either shoulder surgeries or past shoulders trauma. They can't even, it's, I can't bench press, haven't bench pressed for five years, uh, X surgery, can't even get a bar to my chest with no pain. Here, try this. Mm, okay. I did this over the course of two days and every coach that had shoulder problems and pain and couldn't bench, which was like I said, like 80% of them, um, they, uh, this was at the spring training. So I was able to hit three or four uh, teams a day. And uh, so as I'm doing this demo and every, every time was the same story. It was just mind blowing there. They'd start benching. They put a plate on, they put two plates on and some of them hit five reps. Some of them hit three. So on their staff, the whole staff would come around jaws hanging. They're like, Oh, how bad that hurt. Coach would get up. It didn't hurt. So they just benched for the first time in years what they couldn't take a straight bar to their chest, right? Without pain, 225 for reps to a three inch greater range of motion with no pain. Wow. Why? Okay. Well, if we get all these joints stacked and we, it's going to change the inputs, we provide a base of stability to operate from. So you're finding stability from the floor, from the bench, instead of trying the body, trying to find it distally, we start changing those inputs, then go to the brain that then comes out and it's affecting what's firing for trying to stabilize your prime movers versus your stabilizers and so on. And you literally change the pattern that's happening, which changes, like I said, the restrictions, the pain outputs. I can't use the word pain, right? Cause I'm not that professional. Uh, the um, tension, <laughs> right. And, <clears throat> and uh, completely changes those. So now all of a sudden, instead of the wrong things being tight and the pain associated as the, you know, the muscles are tightening around the joint, restricting movement, motion, so creating signals to not lift. We've opened all that up and then allowed a greater range of motion to happen. And what's that going to do from a training perspective? Pretty incredible, right? So those are the things that I've done with Kabuki, like my, 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 my bar for squatting. It's the only bar in the world where we can literally manipulate a person's individual <clears throat> mechanics for spinal mechanics we can manipulate their spine and change the positioning change what's happening from a stabilization pattern that might take a lot of time in coaching to to have happen and make that happen and so the the whole design philosophy is built around understanding that we are all individuals that we all have different lever links. We all have different mobility restrictions. We all have different training needs and that other products need to be able to accommodate for that. And at the same time, preserve the integrity of the joint positions. And if you do all this, this then changes the neurological inputs that are happening in the patterns that are happening 
for uh, within the firing for the muscles and the movements. And so um, that is, and that's it. And the traditional paradigm has been the, you know, I referred to playground physics. We'll take it to preschool. Now, this is a, this is the bar. We need to get everybody through this and everybody needs to squat to this depth with a bar, with this load at the back. Yes. Every single human being should be able to perform able-bodied. So should be able to perform, you know, a, a, a squat movement, but that doesn't mean with an actual load of center of mass, specifically at a certain point in the body, we, like we start creating restrictions and it's like, no, that doesn't apply here. And that we may need to change that. You ever seen like some of the NBA players like squat on their Instagrams and stuff like that. And everybody's just ripping them apart. Cause they're like, that's fucking horrible. I should teach you to squat. As in the, are they, the seven, of, are the they seven foot six? Are they built like that person? Are they like that person cannot do that. And that's why I work with, Massive amount of the NBA and the MLB and all this, because guess what? I can actually change it so that they can actually do the, the, the actual pattern that we're trying to develop and create that load by moving that load in space, which is actually manipulating. So the load always stays over the midfoot. It's physics. You can't, you can't put it way out in front of you or way behind you. You would just fall over, right? The load stays over the midfoot. So what are you doing? You're actually putting the the spine either you're manipulating it around the load. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, and that's what we do with with our bar with being able to change the where the load sits in space. Uh, for example, in the the outputs are just incredible if you actually understand uh, what's happening and what you can do for people. I mean, I yeah, that's. So I give you a little bit of a frame of reference for, I think your audience uh, for what we do. Maybe I keep yeah. going, but I feel like I'm uh, <laughs> yeah, for doing sure. a sales pitch, which isn't my intent, but yeah. <laughs> with the, um, with us adjusting the, the spine position in the squat, for example, um, like I know a basic thing that most gym or PTs do is elevate the heel with like a, mm -hmm. how do, do you want to sort of explain how does that, how does the bar actually sit on the, on the person's shoulders, for example? So uh, it looks very similar to a safety squat bar that it has two handles. Now the two oh, yeah. handles, if you watch anybody that lifts with a safety squat bar, you'll see them miss the lift at what we call the TL junction. It's where the thoracic spine uh, uh, in, in enters, the, the, the connects with the lumbar spine. Well, they're connected all the way through, but uh, uh, where that transition is because they have poor stability in control. It's trying to pull them over and they have very little engagement of the lat. So the lat is actually a spinal stabilizer. And that's how we draw the shoulder into the stabilization that's happening through the lumbar spine, which happens through this creation of what we call intra-abdominal pressurization, which is an eccentric loading of the cavity. So it's not a it's not how most people think about bracing, by the way. It's a very different approach where you eccentrically load that cavity by descending the diaphragm and actually pushing everything out. Uh, if you're using a belt, it'd be a loose belt because you want to expand in it. And then you're going to get a co-contraction of the thoracolumbar musculature, um, uh, the obliques, you know, uh, the, uh, the entire abdominal sling. Uh, and that's going to create this pressure, right? Well, if we don't have that, the upper back tightened, that they'll bend over. So one of the things, our handles come down and allow your hands to be in a position that you can actually engage the lats in. So you see the same thing in a front squat a lot of times too. This rack position with the raised arms gives you poor stabilization uh, at, that, at that point. <clears throat> now, so it looks like that, except the weight, we can actually move further away from center or not and actually change the rotation. So... Sounds complicated, but it's like if you're a coach and you've ever had somebody struggling with being able to, one, uh, create the great pelvis to diaphragm. So your you know, lower rib cage alignment with your pelvis, um, which is how you what you need to do to maximize the IAP to begin with that you have to have a position first. <sighs> if you're struggling with getting somebody to squat really well, if you don't have that, then their knees might be caving, all these other output things that people try to coach. A good coach might say, here, grab a kettlebell and do what's called a goblet squat and hold it out in front of you. All right. This makes all this stuff happen. Uh, so when we load that in front, right, we get more spinal uprighting. Okay, great. 
uh, we get the alignment. Uh, all these things happen that you would normally have to teach very high in depth to be able to work around a bar, a straight bar that's fighting against you. Because a straight bar, again, is causing a great external rotational demand, trying to drive your shoulder out of position, which then is not able to engage the lats, on and on and on. Like we're trying to work around this. So the goblet squat makes that happen. It makes the contraction, the eccentric load and the co-contraction, all this stuff just happen without thinking. Then all of a sudden uh, the other patterns lean up that people realize, oh, their butt wink went away. Their their knees are stacked. Their knees are stacked, <laughs> you know, above their ankles, so on, right? <clears throat> and so this bar can allow that to happen. Now you mentioned the elevation of the heel. So it's really interesting. You don't need to do that for squatting, by the way. Um, but when we talk about neurolo neurology, what happens if this is actually the same system that's in automobiles, by the way, um, if you have a risk, so you're driving a car and the tires are slipping as you're going around a corner, the traction control will kick on. And a lot of people think the traction control is going to take the power that's going from the wheel that's slipping and send it to the one that's gripping. It doesn't do that. What it does is it detunes the transmission, so reduces the shift patterns, the aggressiveness. It detunes the engine, the, the power output, okay? It's trying to detune the system so that you're moving less and with less force production so that it reduces the risk of you sliding off that curve. And <clears throat> so in the body, you know, a lot of people go, oh, your hips are tight. You don't do all your mobility to balance your strength training. Well, strength training doesn't make you tight. Strength training like shit does. So if you're in poor positions and you're loading it, the body is going to try to create some inhibition response. So one, you're not going to be as strong. If you get on a BOSU ball, for example, nothing wrong with training that way, by the way, for specific goals. But if you're doing it for that other reason, it's going to take the load down because mm -hmm. If you're squatting on some squishy shoes, the same thing will happen. You'll have some neural inhibition that reduces your power output. At the same time, the body's going to start protecting the joints that it feels are at risk. So it starts tightening the muscles around those joints. So then a lot of people lack ankle mobility. <laughs> and so they try to fix it by putting, uh, putting that in, which can, you know, uh, is a, is a band-aid, right? And so uh, now that some of that's based on shoes and other topics that lead into that. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, I'm, uh, oh. I'm light these days. I'm 240 pounds, but I used to walk around 270, 280. 270, 280, being able to squat a thousand pounds, deadlift a thousand pounds. I didn't do any mobility work, like any stretching work, right? But I could drop down without stretching and come close to doing the splits almost any day. Right. You don't. These are things like I'm not telling people not to stretch by any means. If you do it and it feels good and you love that, like that's your that's your meditative practice or whatever. Fucking do it. Right. But don't get yourself caught going. I have to do this to balance this other thing that I'm doing. If that's the result, make sure that you're doing the work to understand what am I doing wrong? <laughs> OK, because mm -hmm. this it means there's something wrong with what you're doing you're overtraining or you're moving like crap, right? There's a reason your body is inhibiting it. It's not just because you're, you know, uh, lifting, lifting weights. So, um, I think I might've killed that one to death. Although the, uh, the raised heel one is, uh, is, a uh, is, a uh, is a whole interesting story. If we want to dive into that as a, is a, is a topic, um, well, a, the history of shoes, to... where we're at today and lots of stuff there. It's pretty uh, interesting. I'd love to learn more about um, some of the like common mistakes that people make when they start out with like maybe trying to develop strength. Like what are some yeah. of the, even maybe yourself when you started out, like you may, may have made some mistakes at the start. Like what, what, what have you learned over the years? Yeah. Um, common mistakes would be doing too much would be a very, very pertinent one. So when I mentioned, you're training too much. It's understanding. So you always, you need to be spiking your load intermittently to in, to make progress. That's how you, over time, be able to move up your average capacity for training. And by the way, this ties to uh, 
mental, emotional, the trauma, all this other stuff, as well as for developing resilience, it's all the same thing, is that you have to have some sort of input of it, right? And then you get a response. But it, the, your baseline, your capacity for handling that isn't as much. So me 20 years ago, 30 years ago, mentally, physically, didn't have the capacity to do what I do now. Now, <clears throat> Everybody has a different baseline. So to move that up, you've got to add more. The common mistake is you're just people want to go all in. If you take your average capacity of what you're what you're at for any given day, let's say you're going for a walk for 30 minutes a day, you don't want to spike more than 10 to 15 percent in a week over what your average has been. If you do that, um, that is responsible basically for about 80 percent of injuries in sports. Uh, wow. based on uh, the research by Tim Gavitt out of uh, Australia. And so what happens when people go on vacation? They take two weeks off, they're in the Bahamas, come back, I need to kill it to make up for lost time. Well, your average load actually dropped a little bit because, in, and, and now you're going to make up for it, so you're going to go way up above and beyond, right? So real simple concepts here is you know, build into it, and then make sure you're spiking intermittently. And you don't want to do too much too soon because me, I've been training for over 30 years. Like you got to leave some for next time and leave some for next time when you can push it to a higher net level. Like if you just turn it all, you know, all on. So, um, so, you know, when you see like a program that somebody's done and they are, they're achieving a certain result with it, understand a lot of times they have 15 or 20 years of development to get to where they can do that program you're not going to pick that up off the shelf and start that, right? The rest of it is it's just a balance, right? Of understanding that I have to have inputs to get a response, but I also have to have time and food to recover and grow from that, right? If I have too much training too frequently, uh, too long, I will not make results, because I don't have, now that's taking away from my recovery capacity. But if I take too long between those, my average capacity drops off and I quit having a response. And all I'm doing is inputting and doing the same thing again. You know, the person that comes in and trains two days a week and 15 years later, they're still doing the same thing. They look the same. They're not progressing, right? So <clears throat> real basic, let's do some usable stuff here. I suggest... It, it, that you hit each like body part or kind of movement um, that is hitting all forms of the body about twice a week. Okay. If you're doing once a week, that would be the minimum. So don't fall below that. If you're doing above three times a week, it's probably too frequent. So twice a week is pretty good. Okay. Now we want to hit somewhere between 12 to 18 total good sets during the week for those body parts, okay? All right, good. That means now you have to look at what fits your lifestyle, not what is the most desirable, not what's gonna achieve the greatest results. I mentioned that I was number one in the world for eight years straight. The good part of that time, I was training three days a week. Really? One at one body part only once a week, and it was not optimal, but it's what I had two young kids. I was a high powered executive. And so I had Monday and Tuesday evening from five to seven that I could train and I could get out before the kids got up Saturday morning. And so I made it work and I could perform at a, at a world class level doing that. Could I have done better? Yeah, I sure did better when I quit my job and then training became part of what my my job was. And I ramped that up, but that is, <clears throat> that should give a general level of framework for how to, how to structure that. Because now it's a matter of like, what fits you best? Okay. If it's, Hey, I can fit in four days a week. Oh, if I hit, okay. Then I can probably have a, a whole body routine or a half body routine and another half body routine Monday and Tuesday or two days, take a day off, repeat it. Bam. All right. All right. If I can do five days, 
you know, okay, maybe I can break that up into three different routines. Maybe I got a a, 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 a pressing, a pulling, uh, a leg day, you know, a basic power split routine. And I, I don't quite get all the way through it during the week. And then I start again, you know, the next week, but I'm, I'm hitting everything twice a week, got five workouts, but it's really important to just go, what fits my life and that I can commit to that enhances all aspects? Because if it isn't, it's something that you're only going to do for a short period of time. Same concept with diets, right? Like you don't chew, you don't pick a diet. A diet is a short period of time thing. You pick a lifestyle that you can manage and live with. And then over time, see if you can modify that lifestyle and change it because factors change, right? But that is don't be looking for the perfect routine, the thing that I'm going to follow to get X results. Like, here's the base fundamentals. Now, how do I package that with what works for my life? Mm, I think that's um, some really, really useful advice uh, around like obviously factoring in lifestyle because a lot of people just think on paper in theory that things work out great, but then obviously the, the practical. And the next thing you know, you've committed to two hours a day, five days a week and you're like hit it for three months and you're like, yeah, done, burnt. Like you start missing so on, yeah. Mm. it's interesting i'd love to dive deeper into the nutrition side because obviously you said like matching your food intake accordingly with your training and things like that let's talk about like maybe your like experience and experiments with different uh, macronutrient manipulating macronutrients yeah i'd love to learn yeah you've done there yeah i uh i spent probably about seven years total with um this way before it was trendy uh, with uh intermittent fasting I did like a year at 22 hour a day fast. Uh, this is around from like 2005 to 2015 that I did a lot of this. Um, uh, I've played with uh, keto style diets for short periods of time. Um, done just a lot of different things. And at the end of the day, I don't think that there's any secret magic weapon with any type of diet, right? It's a matter of what works for you. So, I mentioned the intermittent fasting. Well, that period of time, that's when I was a corporate executive. It worked really good. I skipped breakfast and I did the 22 hour fast, but I, then I found like, this doesn't work well for business lunches. <laughs> like, so then I started having a, a light lunch, you know, so about 30% of my calories during the day were taken in during that. And then majority of that quick snack before training, the majority, you know, uh, post-workout that worked really well uh, until I started to really wanted to push the weights and my body weight up further. And that's where I found like the common sense around um, what's healthy foods and not a little bit of that goes out the window because you just literally have to take in a lot of caloric dense type foods to feed that and fuel that. And so that can be a misnomer a lot of times when people get their head wrapped around that health equals performance and not everything that we do for performance, for specific, you know, outcomes is necessarily uh, healthy as well. So uh, for me, where I've arrived at, and this is a, a great opportunity, people go, if you follow my Instagram, go find my wife or just look for her. So she's, uh, she's been on Food Network and the cooking channel, um, Firemasters uh, competition show, and then does a ton of content for barbecue guys and a bunch of other cooking brands. And it's all about promoting the fact that, and, and this is big for me, is you should enjoy your food. And so in our environment, the health environment, so much get, comes down to this, this concept of when you're doing it, it's all rigid and structured and the food tastes like crap. And you can have healthy, amazing food and still make it taste good and enjoy it. And if you do that, your adherence is going to go way up. There's only so long that you're going to eat bland chicken breast and unflavored rice and, you know, and your veggies. So one, I encourage you to really explore uh, the content. So uh, her channel, it's, well, it's just Jacqueline Duffin. Um, so she's got a YouTube as well and uh, website, but uh, Instagram is where she drops most of her content. So really amazing ideas um, around that. And it's what I eat. You can't tell from this, but usually, you know, I'm in the seven to 9% body fat year round uh, these days. And, uh, and you would be blown away by the, the amazing type of food that I eat. 
because it's just about controlling amounts, making sure that you're having good, healthy, well-rounded meals. <laughs> and uh, so I'm not, you know, knocking, you know, people that do, you know, restriction diets or things like that. You know, there's a place for that sort of stuff. If you've got autoimmune uh, disorders and things like that. Now, most of the people that are doing that stuff aren't in that category and it's a little bit more trendy fad, but that's, that's my view. Um, and so, you know, for me is making sure you're eating, you know, good quality foods, lots of meat. And, um, and then also being aware that like the super high fiber and like some of the really healthy approach there sometimes may be counterproductive. So be aware of your internal GI and processing. And because, you know, stuffing in a bunch of broccoli or other things may not be actually good. Doing brown rice instead of white rice may not be good for a lot of people. So we need to be able to have good gastric motility. So the items to really move through and clear and so that you're absorbing the nutrients and stuff. So, so there's, there's a lot of misconceptions, I think, around like people look at that. Oh, you're having white rice. That's not healthy. Why would you do that? It's like, um, actually, my body responds way better to this. Uh, and uh, so so those are, I, I'd say, fairly high level. You know, I've played around with most most items. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, on that front, too, you know, I, I play around with a few different peptides and things that kind of enhance uh, the effects of those items or, you know, help with uh, what I would call adherence, um, you know, uh, uh, GLP-1 agonists are uh, absolutely great. Um, so there's a couple uh, that are liraglutide -glu and semaglutide, uh, really powerful. I like those two because I do have a history of past uh, steroid use during those years, which if you've done that, the uh, androgenic effects uh, reduce your insulin sensitivity. And so things like those uh, those agonists will increase that as well. Um, so I'm a big proponent of, of that. Um, I get a lot of questions around growth hormone and things like that as it recreates to leanness. I'm not a fan of growth hormone, honestly. Again, some of the same negative effects and then also reducing your pituitary output. If you've got somebody that's really good that can really get that dosage dialed, it's a really small amount, not knocking it. Uh, but I think that you can get a lot better results with a lot of, if you want to go down that path, with some peptides that uh, actually promote natural growth hormone release. Um, they just, number of them have different side effects. Some will increase your appetite substantially, uh, but a lot will improve sleep quality, improve skin. Like there's so many effects there. So I'm a big proponent of like some really mild, like um, uh, their GN uh, or GRNH or G, I always forget. GHRP2, GHRP6. Yes. Well, there's, yeah, there's a number of them. So just open discussion. I mean, that's, you know, I, I don't like to have any anything hidden on these factors. I don't do those things all the time, um, but I see significant value in those. Like, you know, if uh, if I see, uh, you know, I monitor my blood sugar and stuff. I've done that uh, actually for a long time. Um, just anytime I've done dietary change, I usually monitor my blood sugar for like two weeks um, to to see that. So. I do that now. Now that wasn't a, a easily viable thing in the past. So it was a lot of spot checking for two weeks with the, uh, the needle. Um, and, uh, but um, yeah. And, and essentially I only do that when change has come in. If I've got a pretty stable piece um, I'll stick with that. But if I've made some changes with my diet, like I'm on an upswing or I'm leaning out or I've made some changes in the types of food um, I'll, 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 I'll monitor that. And it's, you can find some pretty interesting things. Like for me, like ham causes a big spike in blood sugar and then a resulting uh, a drop uh, uh, later. And it's like, it's literally just meat. Like I'm not talking about like the, you know, ham soaked with honey and stuff like that. But like uh, a lot of pork products will cause that response in me. I have no idea why, but it's, you know, <laughs> Wheat. Wow. I'm, I've never, I mean, yeah, that, that must be a whip, pretty for, I've heard of like obviously pork products that are stuffed with like potato starch and things, but it sounds like even good quality. Now, pork. like I said, sometimes it, it's, and it depends a little bit with like what's going on with the rest of my diet at the time too. Um, but 
you'll, you know, and I knew, I already kind of knew that because of the, the effect on the pancreas, because again, like having an independent, you know, too much pork will drive, you know, <laughs> drive me to go to the bathroom, you know, 15 minutes later, pretty in a very needy fashion. Right. As again, the same hormonal, the, the triggers that are rolling in there, it makes sense that that would be happening because it just causes a huge um, release there for me. So it's rather, rather interesting, but everybody responds different to different things. So, uh, so that's my, um, well, I think I'm going way down the, the nerdy out pathway here, but uh, um, I, I, I really think that it's an important thing to, you know, I call myself the mad scientist, but we should all be saying, we all respond a little bit different. And that was the foundation of like the Kabuki strength, right? Like, you know, we all have like, not everybody can perform the same movement with the same mass in the same place. And just because like, so, you know, be looking at these things and, um, you know, just like intermittent fasting for some people doesn't work for a lot of women. It doesn't definitely doesn't work as well uh, just because of the different hormonal profiles and the the point that they'll get to um, where the, the impacts are can be negative. Right. And so it's it, it's 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 very different. Um, you know, you've got people that have heightened stress response and other, you know, other issues that they do intermittent fasting. They'll actually blood sugar will be super high during that period of time because their body is not clearing it and it's the body's dumping the blood sugar, you know, as it's metabolizing uh, the fats in the system, but you know, the body's not responding appropriately. Right. Um, so, so it's always good to, you know, keep an eye and be aware of like, how do I feel? Like, how is my gut health? How is my, like, and be, you know, just be cognizant of those things. Mm. What about like the future? What does the future hold? Do you think in, it's in terms of, I guess, like um, we understand quite a lot around strength science, biomechanics nowadays, but what do you see is going to be the future of, of that space sort of thing? Yeah. Uh, so I have a really comprehensive article I just uh, put out uh, a month or so ago that I think that the there's a whole nother era in basically rehab recovery sports, you know, in the, well, in, in any arena that needs to happen, the, the knowledge is there, the research is there, all this. So if you take a lot of these concepts, so the things that I was talking about, these are the ways that I, from a movement perspective and the neurological inputs are the ways that I can rapidly speed up the recovery response. Um, because a lot of what happens is inhibition, which then limits the ability of, of movement, which is the healer limits the, the blood flow because it's the body is trying to protect uh, itself. It's trying to protect neurology first over muscles. But now it gets really exciting when you combine that with a lot of the, the progress that's being made in other areas. Um, so again, this is in the peptide uh, world. So when you have to understand, you have to have, you have to have raw materials. You have to have signaling um, uh, for those to be used. And yeah, it's, let's put it this way. If you have taken a massive amount of calcium and you don't load your bones, you'll have no bone growth. Okay. If you load your bones, and actually, I've got a great video if anybody wants to know how this happens. It's actually a, it's a piezoelectric charge that happens at the, that level, the little button on your uh, barbecue. Uh, it's the same thing that actually draws the osteoblast and deposits the calcium in the bone structure when you cause a, a bending moment uh, of which a, a load induce. Uh, it's actually a, a, an electrical welding process that increases bone density and heals bones. Okay. Now... <clears throat> It's using calcium as the raw materials, but you have to have the signal. Now you can have all the signals, but if you're in starvation mode and don't have the raw materials, nothing happens, right? And so, you know, understanding, you know, that then combined with like the neurological sig signaling, the inhibition, blood flow, the, which is how a lot of the nutrients are, you know, moved it moved through that. Um, this is where the peptides can get really powerful because now we can actually go down to that cellular level, mitochondrial level uh, with that. And so we can do amazing, amazing things with a combination of stuff. And some of those are affecting brain pathways, neurotrophic factors, nerve stimulation, vasodilation, repair of the physical tissue. So just 
without diving into the science, there's been, I've done one recent client, tore, detached his quadriceps on both legs. He's in the hospital, had them reattached. He's in a wheelchair, had to do rehab in the hospital to learn to be able to walk again, to get to a walker, have straps on his legs. In 12 weeks, 12 weeks, 12 weeks, he was deadlifting 700 pounds from the date of surgery using the protocol of the movement combined with the peptides, combined with topicals that actually drive the peptides deeper. And then also, again, enhance nerve function, turnover, and then also BFR and then equipment, Kabuki tools that all enhance these effects one on top of the other stacking it. I've taken so many people that have torn a quad, not detached, not able to stand, not even able to do a body weight squat, barely able to walk. Okay, because this happens in powerlifting and stuff, you know, <laughs> and uh, had them back competing on a national stage in as little as three weeks and done it multiple times in three to six weeks at a world class level. And it's pulling all that stuff together. And it, it baffles, it just, it mind blows me that, you know, we see like this, you know, an NFL star or something like, you know, with, damaged tissue in his ankle or wherever Achilles. And, and they're like, you know, tape it up, put some corticosteroids in it, get them on the field. Then it tears. And it's like, we could heal this like in like days or a couple of weeks. Like we have the ability, the knowledge, the research is just stacked up on this stuff, but it's gray area. And, <clears throat> and so it's just, it, I, this needs to change in our world today um, because it has so much implications for this isn't performance enhancing stuff. This is straight just getting people to be able to live a better quality of life and be out of pain and recover the tissue. Like it, it's it's just incredible. And so this combination includes a lot of people are familiar with some of the well, I wouldn't say a lot of people depending on where you're at, but uh, BPC-157, uh, TB-500 are really common. Um, I like to combine that with IGF or IGF-1 uh, derivatives, as well as GHK-KU, which is copper, which sounds a little weird. A lot of that's used for topicals and hair loss and stuff like that. It's actually incredibly power com powerful combined with this. Then we bump growth hormone input a little bit, right? Uh, systematically, the the IGF and all that would be, you know, site-specific. Um but that would be, you know, used with CJC 1295 and Ipamimorlin. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, to me, it's just, it's crazy. Like there's all this stuff pulling together should be creating a renaissance in the rehab and recovery fields. And so um, I'm being pretty vocal about that because I think that some people have to raise the flag. And I know, uh, I'm a very respected individual in this, you know, this world. And I've decided to, to raise my hand because I've been I've been doing this for 15 years and coaching doctors and uh, athletes and coaches on this stuff for that amount of time uh, that I've been doing the research on this. And I have seen it just over and over and over again and done it myself. Like, um, you know, another example, I, I was one of those people that tore quad. And couldn't do a body weight squat, you know, had to had to get help walking to my car. And four weeks later, at the animal cage at the Arnold Classic with thousands of people rung around this event. It's a great video, by the way. I squatted 915 pounds, walked over, did a 600 pound bent over row for a double and then walked over and deadlifted 900 pounds in five minutes. Like and I couldn't do a body weight squat just weeks oh. before. Right. From that's that is insane. It, it is insane. Now you have to have all the other. You need to work all the other things as well because this is this is only you know this piece is literally just the cellular, you know the the re recovery of the soft tissue, right itself. When oftentimes the drivers are neurological. When you're understanding how the body is responding and what it's trying to protect, which uh, a lot of times it's going to compromise, you know, muscle or tendon over nerve and understanding like, 
uh, positions and overloading and all these other things that they all drive into the process. And that's where I covered in the scope of this, this article. It's on my personal website, which is Chris Duffin. Like that's like muffin, but with a D um, it's a little hard to find because it's got to go to blog. And there's literally only one article there. Uh, Cause I just started, like I said, I, I finally, I was just like, I, I need to, I need to step up and talk about this stuff because there's so many people that are in the know talking about it, but there's still a lot of big gaps uh, because I, I know a lot of people and I'm like, wow, they're really missing. There's some other things in there because I've been one of the people behind the scenes kind of leading the way on that. Uh, and I'm like, I need to share all that, but also like push the narrative and be very vocal about this because, you know, I'm going in uh, here in just a little bit to get a surgery on my, my elbow issue from about 20 years ago that I've been lagging on dealing with um, when I didn't move well and uh, did a lot of damage uh, to my body. And, uh, you know, I'm going to, it was a very challenging, this is a very, only a few people can do this surgery. So I'm going to one of the top three (laughs) elbow surgeons in the United States. (laughs) And, uh, you know, he doesn't talk about this stuff. He doesn't like, no one, no one does. But if you talk to a lot of these people and they're like, oh yeah, do that. But I, you know, I'm not saying, but again, they don't understand. They can't, pers- everyone should be able to have access to it. That's my thing. Like this should become the standard of care and not something that only some privileged people that have the information and access have the ability to do it. And that's yeah. where it's at right now. I really respect that, Chris. Um, obviously, yeah, these these compounds need to be, you know, I guess like more widely known and, and utilized in, in medicine. And unfortunately, 99% of people have never heard of them before. Like never heard of And the research, I mean, this isn't like, the, the, these aren't like, you know, untested things. Like the research is there. It's just in this gray area. None of them are illegal. And a lot of them, they are prescribed by a lot of anti-aging clinics and stuff like that. So again, the privileged, the people that know and have access, they're getting this. You know, when you do see those sports stars turn around and get healed in a couple of weeks, that probably had somebody on their backside helping them out. Right. Um, But, you know, it's it's on the down low. Don't tell anybody. Um, And then a couple of them are, you know, they are on the water list. So you definitely need to be careful if you're in tested sports, because I do not suggest that anybody take something that doesn't meet uh, those compounds. But it's also just ridiculous to me that they've put something on the water list that isn't a performance enhancer. Like it will not enhance performance, but it's going to, it'll bind to that damage receptor (laughs) and organize things that need to happen to facilitate the recovery process. Uh, So, yeah. So the whole thing is just so broken. Um, Yeah. It's like with that, with that article, I'll make sure to leave that uh, linked in the show notes for those listening in so they can find that on your website. Um, we could, we could definitely talk all day about the different peptides and and recovery protocols. Um, but I'd like to let my listeners know more about like where they can find more of your, your content. So obviously you mentioned your Instagram and and your book as well. So do you want to let them know how they can connect with you further? Yeah. So just go to chrisduffin.com. Um, like I said, muffin, but with a D all right, Chris Duffin, and there'll be links to all my social media. There'll be links to Kabuki strength barefoot athletics, as well as if you sign up the email exclusive discounts, uh, for those, um, the places that I'm most interactive on, uh, for social platforms is Instagram and LinkedIn. I know LinkedIn sounds funny, but think about all the professional, uh, in the realm that I deal with and the, the sport coach, uh, side of stuff. Um, I am on TikTok and Facebook, but just don't really interact there as much. But again, I'm not, you don't remember that. Just type in my name, Chris Duff, and I got a little blue check thingy next to me on Instagram and, and, and Facebook. You'll, you'll be able to find me. It's not complicated. Um, there's a link to my book. Uh, you can find it on Amazon and Audible as well. Uh, but there's a link on my site. If you don't have Audible, sign up on the via the link on my site. I do get a little kickback from that, but uh, I think everybody should have that uh that, that platform. So I, I have that set up on there, um, that you can get it free as well as another book, uh, for free, uh, via that. So I highly recommend that you, it's not, I think there's three pages on lifting in there and it is, it's written to help guide you on a path of introspection. I used my story not to tell like 
I could have told a whole lot more horrible and graphic stories and other stuff, but it's it's a piece to articulate some really important messages. And there's a reason that it's a bestseller in human psychology, stoic philosophy, self-improvement. And I had to think eight other things and just read the reviews on it. Five star on both platforms. So it's uh, it's the real deal. You're going to enjoy it. It's a great read. Awesome. Awesome. Make sure, make sure to leave those linked in the show notes, but uh, otherwise, Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a, it was a pleasure chatting. Thank you. I apologize. I, I talk so much and didn't give a, a whole lot of uh, interaction back and forth, but the questions were just so like, I was ready. They're, they're, they were great. And I just had to dive in. So yeah. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, we'll keep in touch and um, yeah. Thank, thanks. Thanks again. All right. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining in to today's episode. For in-depth show notes and lessons learned, visit nofilter.media forward slash boost your biology. This has been a No Filter Media production. Say what you want.